Okay, I think everybody has been muted, so that may, must mean that it's start, time to start our service. So, good morning and welcome to everybody, the Thomas Risley's Zoom service. Um, our service to today is led by Stuart Nixon, and our technical control is Steve Erhart. After the service, we will have a prayer room that's open. There will be a question comes up on the screen. All you need to do is just um, click yes or no, I think. Right here. Um, just to encourage you to have a look at the, um, the newsletter, which is on the, um, on the website, if you've not received it via email. So have a look at that. It's got the readings for next week on, so it's worthwhile having a look at. Okay, so uh, if you could remain muted, unless you've got a, a job to do during the service, then that would be brilliant. And and we'll now hand you over to Steve, sorry, to Stuart Nixon. Good morning, everybody. Hope we're all well this morning. Uh, today we're going to be thinking about God's big picture, uh, the, 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 the enormous uh, plan of God and where we might fit into it. But first, we're going to start off with a psalm of praise, Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing of him, sing his praises, tell of all his wondrous, wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. And that's what worship's about. It's about seeking God's face. It's about drawing close to him. And that's what we're going to do now. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can draw close to you. We can seek your face. We can bring our praises to you. And may we in this few moments now, as we gather together as your people, seek your face, know your presence, be filled with your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for this time we share. And we thank you for your word that we'll hear later. We praise you that you do have a plan, a big picture. And at the heart of that is your son, our saviour, Jesus. May he be at the centre of our lives. And as we come, we also come to offer our praise, our worship. And also to pray that you would forgive us for all the things that we've done and said and thought that have not matched your perfect love. Forgive us now, Lord. Cleanse us and make us new once again, as you've promised in your word. We ask these prayers in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to have the Lord's Prayer with the Gemble family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us, Lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. evil. For the, the kingdom, the power and the, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And apparently this is the moment that we do the birthdays. And I'm pretty sure we've got one, at least. So if you've got a birthday, either that we missed last week 
It's coming up um, this week. Will you? Yeah. Please let us know. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can see Lynn waving a hand. Now I can see Mark Higgs waving his hand as well. Mark, is it your birthday? Sorry, I can't hear no, you. You're on no. mute, but I think that's a no. <laughs> okay, so to Lynn, who is going to have her birthday, is it tomorrow, Lynn? Yes, 66 oh. clickety clicks. <laughs> oh, brilliant. What a fantastic age. Brilliant. So let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lynn. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. And uh, now we're going to have our Bible readings, uh, and Helen's going to read our first reading from Exodus. So this reading is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, and it's entitled Moses and the Burning Bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There... The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. David Thurston's going to bring our next reading. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him to a side and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, 
but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again for your word. And we ask, Lord, that you will speak to us through your word this morning. Holy Spirit, inspire the words we've heard. And may they be real to us today. Challenge our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're thinking about God. It would help if I unmuted and then we'd know what we were doing. <laughs> we're going to start off um, with God's big picture today. As you may know, my previous job a long time ago was I worked for the Met Office. And one of the trickiest things is not so much doing the job that I did, which was observing the weather, because you can always look outside and see what's going on, but actually forecasting it. And, and that's the job the Met Office are really into. Forecasting weather is really, really tricky. You may find that people on TV make it look easy. Owen Wynne Evans gets up in his smart suit on every evening and he gives us his best guess at what the bank holiday weather might be. And he makes it look quite simple. But it can be very, very tricky. Because the weather is not static. And the whole globe moves, the whole atmosphere of the globe moves around. We need to see the big picture when we're forecasting the weather to understand what's going to happen in our garden for our barbecue this bank holiday weekend. You have to understand the whole complexity of the atmosphere at so many different levels. You have to understand how the oceans interact with the atmosphere above it. You have to understand all sorts of local effects as well, the difference that the Welsh mountains might make to Warrington if the wind's coming from that direction. It's a huge thing and very complex, but somehow they give their best guess. And most of all, mostly that ends up okay. Our barbecue on bank holiday weekends are either in the rain or in the sun, more often probably in the rain. But we have to understand the big picture before we can understand what's happening locally. And it's a bit like that with God's plan. God has this massive plan, huge plan for, for the salvation of the world, for, for the whole earth, for every person on it. And we're in there somewhere in that part. We have a part to play in this big picture. Thinking of our, our Bible passages. Moses. Well, if you were here last week with Kate, um, we had Moses as a baby uh, being pulled out of the bulrushes in a, uh, and uh, being given to uh, Pharaoh's daughter, but also his mum was allowed to bring him up. We've moved on a bit now. Uh, we've moved on in the story. Moses is now grown up, no longer a baby, and is a murderer. So there's a good place to start. He's killed an Egyptian, possibly out of all the right intentions. He saw God's people suffering under slavery with whips and being made to make bricks. Um, and, and he was really angry at the slave drivers. 
And so he killed one of the Egyptian slave drivers. Now, this meant that his life was under threat. Even though he'd become Pharaoh's adopted son, he'd done the wrong thing. And so he had to run away. And that's where we find him now. He's run away to a place called Midian, which for God's people was a foreign land. We're talking probably near enough 150, 200 miles away from where he was in Egypt. So quite a long way to run, uh, almost as far as, uh, as Ron's going to be cycling in a few weeks' time. And it, what he's done, he's set up home there. He's married uh, a local priest's daughter called Zipporah. Uh, they've had a baby called Gershom, catchy name, uh, and, uh, and settled up. So he'd, he'd become a farmer. He'd uh, followed what his, uh, his in-laws had a farm and he was farming. Uh, but meanwhile, there's another story going on. In Egypt, God's people are still suffering. God's people's slavery's got worse. While Moses has run away and takes up shepherding, God's people are under the cosh severely. Now, if you think about it, Moses was in Pharaoh's court. He would have had all the uh, advantages of being part of Pharaoh's family. It's a bit of a come down. I mean, even though shepherding and farming was in such an important part of life, it was a bit of a come down to come from being a fa from being Pharaoh's son to being a humble shepherd. So you can imagine Moses at this point wondering where his life was going. Well, what's brought me here? I've been 40 years living in Midian and, I, and what, what's going on? Why am I doing this? What, what's brought me here? What, where's my life heading? And I wonder if we sometimes feel like that. Where's my life heading? What's God want from me? What's happening in my life? What direction is God taking me in? Now, Moses had an advantage here because suddenly, as he's out farming the sheep, God appears to him. Not in a small way, not in a little voice, but at the burning bush that wasn't consumed by the fire. Now, that's not an everyday occurrence. I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen a burning bush. Uh, and if God's ever spoken to me, it's not been out of a burning bush. But this is where God speaks to Moses. And Moses glimpses a sight of God's big picture for him and God's people. We wonder, particularly today in, in this sort of COVID world, uh, what, what is going to happen in the world? What's the future going to hold for us? And sometimes we think about it, but then we get scared to think too hard. What is God's plan for the world as it goes forward? It's a big thing to think about. Some of us may think it's too hard. It's just too big a thing to think about. Or... Perhaps if we think hard about it or even consider it at all, it might demand something from us personally. So it's easier sometimes to get very blinkered and stay comfortable, not think too hard, not pray about it, not consider what God's plan might be for us and the world. But Moses hasn't got that option. He is shaken out of his comfort zone. And there are a few things that we can learn from his example and later on Peter's example that we heard in the gospel reading. First, we have God's big picture is that God knows us. Second, God's big picture is that we expect to be challenged. And third in God's big picture um, is to be obedient. So let's think about this. God's big picture. God knows us. I don't know if it's just me, but I like to watch a film on a big screen. 
I love to see action movies. They're my favourites. I like to see superheroes. I like to see James Bond, all those things where there's lots of flashing explosions and, and all those sort of things and people being rescued and, and all that sort of stuff. I, I love all that. But I like to see it on the big screen. I've never quite got used to seeing movies on a tablet or worse, on a mobile phone. I just don't get it. I mean, maybe it's just my age. Maybe I'm getting to that age where I don't get modern technology, but I just don't understand it. The films are not designed to be on such a small device. I like the big picture experience. Films and TV programmes are designed according to the medium on which they're shown. Big picture films, in my opinion, need to be on a big screen or we miss things. I think that's true. And Moses was about to get a glimpse of God's big picture. He needed to see it written large, not in some small form, but massive. And that's why God gets his attention with this burning bush and this voice that comes from it. And the message, God's plan is the liberation of God's people from slavery but also being taken into a land that has been promised to them. And it echoes the promise that God gave to Abraham all those years ago. And remember, God says to, to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob. He's reminding Moses of that original blessing, that plan that God had, that God's people would flourish and there would be as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the beach. He's reminding Moses that there's a bigger plan happening here. And Moses needed to see this. He needed to see it big and bold to get him out of his comfort zone. And can you hear this, that the burning bush was talking to him, to Moses, and it called out his name. It says, Moses, Moses. It spoke directly to him. God knows Moses personally. And he knows us personally. And the other thing he knows is that we all have a part to play in his big picture. We may feel that sometimes our offerings are fairly small and, and inadequate and, and, and don't amount to very much. But that's because we don't always see the massive picture that God has in our lives. God knows us personally. He calls out to us. He calls out. He says, Steve, Steve. He says, Fiona, Fiona. He says, Maggie, Maggie. He says, Edna, Edna. He says, Mark, Mark. And everybody, he calls out to us because he knows us by name. And he says we have a part to play in his plan. Now, we may not see the whole of that plan because it's massive. But God will reveal to us his plan enough for us to make the next steps. Where we fit into things, he will reveal to us. One of the things he requires of us and he required of Moses was some holiness Moses was going to walk towards the bush, which is a natural thing when it's calling out your name. You go towards it. But God says, don't come any closer. This place is holy. Take off your sandals. Take off your shoes. This is a holy place. So he requires from us a level of getting to know him, getting closer to him, but actually expecting him to speak to us. But also a level of holiness, forgiveness, knowing his, his life in our lives. We also need to listen. We need to listen to, through prayer to what God might be saying to us. Moses listened to God when he called his name. And we have to match up what we hear with what the Bible teaches us as well. If something doesn't match up with the general feeling of the direction of scripture, then we're probably not hearing from God. But if it seems to match up, if it's about love and furthering God's kingdom if it's about um, uh, being uh, following the Ten Commandments, then we're probably OK with the direction and what we're hearing from God there. It's called discernment. We have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us and where we might fit in to God's big picture. 
we may not always consider God's picture, as I said, God's big picture, but because it's so big. But what we can be assured of, and I think maybe, you know, Moses perhaps experienced this, is that God has only the best intentions for us. That's not to say everything in our lives will go perfect. It's not to say we won't suffer, we won't have troubles in our lives. But in the end, his big picture, his big plan is for the best. As we know, there's those famous words, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's not to say we will have all the gold and finances in the world, as some people seem to think that passage means. I don't think it does. I think the more important thing is that God is with us through all the times, whether they're good or bad. And his biggest plan is to give us a hope and a future that we have something to live for that's bigger than just our small lives. So that's God's big picture. We're part of it. God's big picture, expect to be challenged in it. Moses suddenly realised all the reasons why following God's plan that's just been taught to him was not a good idea suddenly he realizes that it's down to him that god's actually asking him to go and rescue god's people moses takes a time and then goes hang on me i've got to be part of god's plan i've got to do this me moses and he says who am i that i should go to pharaoh and bring the children of israel out of egypt now remember that he's been part of Pharaoh's household. So Pharaoh, whether it's the next Pharaoh, which it probably was, uh, would still have recognized him, wouldn't know who he was. And the big job of bringing all God's people out of Egypt. He says, who am I to do that? I think perhaps we all do that. <laughs> I certainly do. I have a great plan. I think it may even be a great plan from God. And then I think of all the reasons why I shouldn't do it and talk myself out of it. This doesn't happen, thankfully, because Moses listens to God. God is with him. God is right in front of him and he still questions it. But in the end, he knows God's presence with him. In the passage from Matthew, Peter similarly starts to be concerned after Jesus lays out how the salvation plan for the world will unfold. Jesus says, my life, this is where it's going. It's going to be suffering. I'm going to be unfairly tried. I'm going to see crucifixion. I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised to life. Can you imagine being one of Jesus's friends? hearing this, the one that you've been around for a couple of years and seen the miracles, heard the teaching, and now Jesus is saying he's going and he's going to go in a terrible, painful way. Peter naturally says, well, this can't be it. This isn't the big plan. This is not how I saw it all finishing up. I thought we'd ride out of here as heroes. And this is where Jesus brings a challenge. He challenges Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Not the sort of word you expect from gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is it? To one of his best friends. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance, he says to him. You've become, as the Greek says, a hindrance is a stumbling block. So he's become from being Peter the rock a few moments ago to Peter the stumbling block. Something that you trip over. And the reason he's doing this, the reason that Jesus is challenging Peter is because he's saying to him, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of human beings. What he's saying to Peter is you're facing the wrong direction. You're looking at it from your perspective and not God's. You haven't got yet God's big picture in your head. And then he goes on to teach. Jesus says, uh, and when all this has happened, I will come back in glory with the angels and I will restore 
the world and bring the new heaven and the new earth. That is God's big picture. Reminds me a bit of the story of Job as well. He suffered. We may know the story. Job has suffered so many things. He's lost his family, his, his fields. He's had boils. He's had a terrible time. And you can understand he's a bit fed up with it all. And so he cries out to God. He calls out, he even sort of argues with God. Why has all this happened to me? And then he has some friends that come along and try and help him, which aren't much, much help because they just say, well, well, it's either all your fault or it's all somebody else's fault or, you know, Job's comforters, as, as we know. And in the midst of this, God then speaks out his challenge to Job. He says, in this, the big picture, you've not quite seen it. God says this, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, I have the big picture here. I've got it under control. Trust me. And sometimes we need to hear those words. When we face those difficult times, we don't know what God's plan is. We can't quite see, as we say, the wood for the trees. What we need to do is to learn to trust that God is somehow, somewhere in control of it all. Now, God's big picture is vast, but we have a part to play in it, just like Job, like Moses, like Peter. But we will be challenged. Is it our way or is it God's way? Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He also says, if you follow me, you will deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. God's big picture is about trusting him and being prepared to be challenged by him, to be shaken out of our comfort zones. In Moses' case, God tells him that he, the great I am, will be with him. This may not have been what Moses had hoped or expected. Perhaps he'd help, hoped that he'd give him some miraculous power that would show thunderbolts or something to help them, to, the people of Israel, to see who he, who he was representing. But Moses went with it. He accepted God's challenge and said, I am going to follow you and do what you've asked. And that takes us on to the next and final point. God's big picture requires obedience. Doing what God requires or asks of us, not what we want to do. Moses could quite, quite rightly have said, that's too big a job for me. I'm not going to bother. Peter could have said, no, Lord, no, I'm going to go with my way. Your way can't be right. Mary, if we think of Mary, when, when the Holy Spirit comes to her and says, you're going to bear the son of God. She could have said, instead of said, let it be to me, as you have said, she could have said, ha, you're having a laugh. It's about obedience. That old song that says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Obedience these days is something many of us struggle with because we like to do our own thing, sometimes because it's easier, sometimes because it's more comfortable. But anybody that knows uh, who has had children or animals and has had some level of trying to teach them and train them knows that it's a hard path. Dog training, for example, it's about obedience training, it used to be called. Trying to get your dog to do the right thing at the right time. And that's not easy. It takes effort, it takes time. And sometimes it doesn't always work. But it's worth the effort. However, that's what God wants of us. Not that we become puppets and just do whatever God sort of directs us to. We're not puppets of God. We have free choice. We can follow God's path or we can choose to do our own thing. And doing God's thing is called obedience. The reason we do that is not so that we get patted on the head and told what good people we are. It's because God has a bigger, more exciting plan for everybody. And if we pay our part in that, if we're obedient to what God wants us to do, then we will see something of that plan around us. Anne Calver, who uh, 
is part of uh, the New Wine leadership team. She's a Baptist minister. She puts it like this. Today, the media says, pursue comfort, be consumers, and you will be happy. But in fact, the message of Jesus is, take up your cross and follow me. That's the way to life. And come as far as you can towards Calvary. Keep dying to self. The more we love him ahead of anything else, the further we can go with him. Because he will put, we will put him ahead of everything else. He's ahead of everything else. His big plan is more than we can imagine, but he's better than we can imagine too. Moses, as we know, was obedient in the end. We see him taking the people out of Egypt, and maybe that's in another couple of weeks, so I won't steal anybody's thunder. But God's big picture happens because God's people flourish. Because God's big picture is a rescue plan. He rescues God's people from slavery to the land of milk and honey. And then through those people, eventually we meet Jesus. That is God's big picture. The rescuer of the whole world from sin and death. And an experience of God's love and grace and mercy. And we have a part to play in God's rescue plan, his big picture. But we can be assured that God knows us. He knows our limitations. He knows how he can use us. He calls us and he draws us on. We know he will challenge us in that. But there will be challenges so that we won't always think we can do what God's calling us to do and understand the whole of his amazing plan. But he's calling us to do that. And he expects our obedience to follow him because there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. It's God's plan, his big picture, and we're a part of it. Amen. And we're gonna hear a song now, sing along if you feel you want to, but uh, listen to the words. It's about uh, helping us remember that God is in control. He's our living hope. He is the one who calls us and helps us to see his bigger picture. So it's God's living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. Grip on me. 
began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body Silence, the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus, yours is the victory Hallelujah, praise the one who said Steve's going to lead us in our prayers for the wider community uh, and the church and the world. Thanks, Stuart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that we are able to meet as your church. We thank you that we are able to to grow in our faith, to learn more about you, to learn more about each other, to be a family together. Father, for many of us, the world is difficult at the moment with the coronavirus. Um, although the, we thank you that the, the death rates are much lower, the virus is still very much there. Many people are frightened. Many people are struggling with uh, the, the financial implications. And Father, this is happening not just in our community here, but right across the country and right across the world. This week, we know that the, the schools are starting to go back and we're thankful that, that they are able to go back and, and we pray that People, the, the young people will get the education that they will desperately need to find their places in the world as we move forward and, and as they grow into adults. But we know that that means more people together and we know that that means that, that we'll have to be even more vigilant um, and even more careful with, uh, with infection rates and I just ask that you'll help us to all to all to play our part in in whatever that means and follow the leads that our scientists and government tell us we need to do. Father, we pray for our government and pray that they will find probably novel and new and different ways of of managing the economy and managing the country and, and helping us all move more and more back to a, a normality and a, and, a, and a sense of community and prosperity that, that maybe may have struggled over a while. Father, we just thank that we're not in this on our own, that you're with us, that we're in this together. Father, we just offer a moment or two now for 
for us each to offer the the people and the the situations that are on our hearts. Father, we offer all of these prayers in your in, in your Son, Jesus Christ's perfect name. Amen. Thanks, Steve. And so as we bring our time of worship to a close, we're going to sing our final song, which again speaks of God's hope, his big picture, and our part within it, and how we can give thanks that he's chosen us and we're part of what he has to do. We're going to sing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his hope
do you, do you know that's one of my favourite songs? So, um, let us all unmute now and let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.